How do you do? Away with words is all about the English language. But who are the English? What are they doing in Great Britain? Who do they think they are? And why are they so potty about dogs? Hey now, say now, let's get away now. Away with words. Words like we say each and every day. Away with words. What's in the name? What do you say? There's so many words at the end of the day. I talk, you talk, they talk, we all talk. Away with words. Away with words. Four pound for a pound. Who want bananas? Thanks to modern global telecommunications, it's hard to go anywhere in the world and not meet someone who can speak English. But who are the English? Have they always lived here in the British Isles? And if not, where have they all come from? It's market day at Bury St Edmunds and the traders are using their own brand of English to sell their wares. Thousands of years ago, these islands were inhabited by nomadic tribes. They spoke a kind of Indo-European language called Brythonic. And they called themselves the Brythons. In fact, they were the very first Britons. Have they sold the sheep and lamb? Right? I don't know. Well, a bit better price than they were for us. Yeah. There ain't many up here anyhow, is there? No, that's right. There ain't many cattle either, is there? No, very poor. The first Britons lived fairly simple lives until their tiny little islands attracted the attention of a sizeable Roman army, led by no less than Julius Caesar. He came, he saw, and he conquered. And the Romans stayed around for over 400 years. But what, you might ask, as indeed did Monty Python, have the Romans ever done for us? Well, for a start, the Romans introduced us to pubs. Inns and taverns soon lined all the roads that the Romans built throughout Britain. A bunch of leaves or a bush was placed outside the door in order to tell travellers where to stop. And that's how we got one of the first names for pubs, the bush. Of course, if the wine was particularly good and people kept coming back for more, then you needn't put a bush outside the door because, as the saying goes, good wine needs no bush. Now, it's said that a Roman soldier was paid partly in salt, which was a very useful commodity, and that therefore the Latin word for salt, salarium, is the root of our modern word salary. A good soldier was therefore worth his salt. Salute! Of course, the Romans didn't just leave us words. We still use their numerals, which have the great advantage of using just seven letters to express all the numbers from one to one million. The Romans also gave us the word trivia. It comes from the Latin tri, meaning three, and via, meaning ways. And it literally means three ways. And whenever three roads met, the Romans would often leave little notes and snippets of information for each other. I'm beginning to feel a little like a fish out of water. Oh well. When in Rome. Archaeologists have proved that the Romans gave us our first taste of urban life. The shopping mall, the amphitheatre, public baths and good water. But maybe not all of their contributions to life were quite so civilised. The Romans also knew a thing or two about swear words. Apparently, they had over 800 names for the male, um, thingy. Not to mention anything else. Ow. The Roman legions were a very strictly disciplined bunch. Having two drills a day, 
marching 19 miles at a standard stepping rate, and carrying 60 pounds of equipment on their backs. All this sounds like a lot of hard work for people a very long way from home. But remember, Rome was not built in a day. Who would have thought that of all the Roman soldiers stationed in Britain during their long occupation, that Tetricus, a 17-year-old from the 9th cohort of Batavians, is now known to us 2,000 years later because his mum sent him a letter with two pairs of socks and two pairs of underpants in it. Of course, the Romans also gave us sandals. I don't know, what with underpants, socks and sandals, the British male has a lot to be thankful to the Romans for. I mean, stylish, aren't they? Quite a fashion statement, I think. We get the word mile from the Latin mile, meaning 1,000. A Roman mile was 1,000 legionnaires' steps. And they say all roads lead to Rome. But this one goes to Colchester. What's that strange throbbing noise? You're tuned to Radio Romanus Mondos, coming to you from the heart of downtown Colchester. All the latest sports and all the latest magazines coming out with new singing from Nero's Fiddle, Nicholas Pelagos, Nelson, Coliseum, Christian's Mill, Lions 8. When you look at Colchester today, it's quite hard to imagine it was a Roman town because so little of the Roman buildings remain. But sometimes costumes and traditions can outlast buildings and city walls. Costumes and traditions such as weddings. We are gathered here to witness the joining in matrimony. I am not of any lawful impediment. Of any lawful impediment. My I like a good wedding, and this ceremony has much in common with its Roman equivalent. Roman bridegrooms used to carry their brides over the threshold. The favorite season for a wedding was June, and the bride's dress was traditionally white. The Romans did, however, follow their weddings with a sacrifice, usually a pig, something that had to be done before the marriage certificate could be signed. Sue and Steve are getting married here today, but as far as I know, pig isn't on the menu. They probably got some jolly good sandwiches, though. Stephen, you may now kiss your bride. <laughs> the throwing of confetti is a substitute for the original custom of throwing corn, an ancient fertility rite. The word itself comes from the Latin confetto, meaning sweets. Congratulations! <laughs> A month of revelry followed a Roman wedding, during which time they would drink mead made from honey and meadowsweet. And that's where we get the name Honeymoon. But when the honeymoon is over, and you found your ideal home, and you're waiting for the patter of tiny feet, what else is there to do but take the dog for a walk? Here, boy. Here, boy. Let's go, shall we? Yeah. Romans use dogs in much the same way as we do today. Guard dogs, hunting dogs, and pets at home. I know you don't like your bath, but you'll feel all the better for it. Henry is a three-year-old St. Bernard, a very large and tough breed of dog, originally kept to rescue travellers by the monks of the St. Bernard Pass in the Alps. I wonder what the Romans would think if they saw the length that people go to nowadays to keep their pampered pets looking great. To be in the doghouse clearly doesn't really need much explanation. Whoever's in there has obviously done something wrong. 
My favourite is, darling, your dinner's in the dog. The phrase, the hair of the dog, is said to come from the ancient belief that if you were bitten by a dog, the best cure was to place some of its hair over the wound. The best hangover cure is therefore said to be another drink, the hair of a dog that bit you. Go. Go. I think it's probably fair to say that the elderly do get set in their ways. I mean, you can't expect someone who was turned on by Frank Sinatra to suddenly be switched on to Snoop Doggy Dog. And that's where we get the saying, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. But this little fella here, quite another matter. I'm teaching him a trick or two right now. E equals MC squared. E equals MC squared. E equals MC squared. The saying, no room to swing a cat, actually refers to the cat of nine tails, a whip that was used to flog sailors on board ship. The floggings took place on deck because the cabins were too small to swing the cat. Well, for saying a dog's life clearly doesn't apply to Henry, I think he has a pretty good time. Time to take him home, though. Join me in part two, and we'll see if we can get any nearer to finding out who the English really are. Oh, is this a belt? In 410 AD, the Romans left Britain and their civilization for the next wave of invaders, the Anglo-Saxons. But the new settlers weren't interested in the deserted Roman towns. Instead, they chose to make their homes in small rural villages. They called their new country Engloland. And their language English. The long suffering Britons were driven out to the west. The Anglo Saxons called them Welas, which is the origin of the word Welsh. Here at Westow Anglo Saxon village near Thetford, they recreate all aspects of Anglo Saxon life. And in the nearby woods, I'm off to find Colin Levick, one of Britain's best longbow men. And he knows a thing or two about hunting and many of the words associated with archery. And I believe the sayings start as soon as you begin to prepare your bow, don't they, Colin? Yes. Brace yourself. That means we don't shoot with a, an unstrung bow, because it's useless. Yeah. So we brace the bow. So brace yourself. There we're bracing. We've then got to check that the bow isn't highly strung. Mm -hmm. In other words, erratic. So we do that by rule of thumb. Oh, I see. The, the length of your thumb should be how far right. away then? Yes. I mean, I know that's just that little bit. And that's rule of thumb. That's it. And what about keeping your tabs on? Well, um... Or keeping tabs on. This is a tab. It's a little piece of pony skin that protects my fingers and allows me to get a nice loose. If I've got that on, I'm keeping tabs on the situation. I'm aware of what's going on. I'm ready to act You're at the ready? first possible at the moment. Right. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Yeah. Well, we're going to go off uh, doing a little bit of stalking now, aren't we? Yes. And uh, do you think you could uh, train a fairly city slicker type like me from the 20th century in the, in the art of hunting? We'll, we'll have a go. I mean, the main thing is patience. Patience. What you've got to remember with a deer is that its eyesight is not very good, but mm. it can smell you 100 yards away. Um, it can also hear you if you tread on a twig. So we've got to keep downwind of it. To make sure that we don't tread on any twigs at all as we're going. It's quite difficult not to break twigs in this place. Yes. Make sure you're not smelling as well. No, no it's not too bad. <laughs> now, what about the saying uh, to be the butt of? That comes from archery too, doesn't it? Yes, later on when everybody had to practice. They built a thing called a butt for people to practice on on a Sunday morning. Yeah. And all able-bodied men had to turn out and um, shoot at the butt. So to be the butt of is to receive all sorts of um, shots that you be didn't target, expect to be the target of, yeah. yes. <laughs> Wow, 
going on? Brilliant. Venison tonight. Meat on the table. Yes. Yes, a direct hit. Oh, come off it. You don't think we'd shoot a real deer, do you? This is television. Well done, Collins. A very good strike. Anything I can do to help now? Yeah, I think you'd carry the meat home for dinner. The meat? Oh, that's a bit tough to me. <laughs> <laughs> Hi ho! Beautiful. Tonight we ride to Nottingham and drink wine with my father. <laughs> That's a terrific shot, Colin. I noticed you didn't sort of take much time to aim. You never do. It's um, what we call an instinctive shot. You just look at it, and yeah. you let your body do the rest, and the body's perfectly capable. The warrior-like Anglo-Saxons settled down and became peaceful farming people. And today, our farming vocabulary is full of their words, like ox, pig, Plow, shepherd, swine, dog, wood, field. An early form of Anglo-Saxon irony. As their skills and domestic life improved, so the Saxon language developed although it still didn't sound anything like modern English. Keen to find out more about the Anglo-Saxon language, I met up with Steve Pollington. Now, Steve, you're one of the few people who can still speak Anglo-Saxon. How similar is Anglo-Saxon to the English we speak today? Well, Anglo-Saxon, or Old English, is the very basis of the English that we still use today. Uh, it is not possible to make a modern English sentence without using Old English words. Uh, the the core vocabulary of English, such as parts of the body and so on, all come down from the, the Anglo-Saxon times. Some of our days of the week come from Anglo-Saxon, don't they? Well, pretty well all of them, actually. The, the days of the sun and the moon. Um, what's that, Sunday? Sunday and Monday. All right. And then Tuesday is named for the, from the god Teal, a god of war. Wednesday is Woden's Day. Oh. Thursday is from Thunor, the thunder god. And Friday is from the goddess Frigge who is the goddess of fertility and love. And then Saturday, something of anomaly, it's based on the Roman god Saturn. Of course, wash and go are also Anglo-Saxon words. As indeed are head and shoulders. The Saxons had many varied skills and were excellent craftsmen. With something as complex as weaving, it's easy to see why people less skilled could quickly lose the thread of what they were doing. Baker's knee is another name for knockmead. Bakers were said to get this condition because of the way they have to hold their knees together while they're kneading the dough. Whether you're sitting down or standing up, they could end up not kneed or with baker's knee. Oh, you're making a flatbread there, Tony. Here's the dough, Tony Delvin. All right. This is the best thing before sliced bread. Chicken feed has come to mean something small and trivial because it's the cheapest and least nourishing corn you give to the chickens. They seem to enjoy it anyway. The phrase pecking order also comes from chickens, whose social order is defined by who pecks who and why and where? A bit like us, really. During the evenings, the Saxons would entertain each other with stories of great Quack. deeds and mighty gods. We gardena on yer dachum thaud kuninga thrum yefrunon. The ancient tradition of storytelling was passed on from generation to generation, but no two renditions were ever the same. Monechum maithum, maudu setla of teach. 
This story of Beowulf almost certainly originated in East Anglia. It ties in legends and folk tales of this part of the world with those from all the countries surrounding the North Sea. It's a tale of gremlins and nasty things that happen in the night. These stories can still be heard today, albeit set to music. Wagner based the four operas of his Ring Cycle on the Old Norse legends. Characters like Siegfried, Brunhilde, the Valkyries and the Rhine Maidens all come from Norse legends. To be honest, I've never really been that fond of Wagner and it's taken me years to actually get to like opera itself. You see, when I was a child, my parents used to sing opera to one another and it was really quite startling. They dabbled in Puccini and Verdi, but being English, they adored Gilbert and Sullivan. The word soprano literally means high because it comes from the Italian word sopra, meaning above. Tenor comes from the Latin tenere, to hold, because the tenor is the guy who holds the melody most of the time. The word falsetto literally means little false voice, because it's not the natural voice of the male singer. Don't you get irritated by presenters battering on and on and on while people are performing? I do. Go away, go on. Go away. Well, they say the show ain't over until the fat lady sings. I haven't heard any fat lady sing yet, have you? And as far as I can see, we're not likely to. The English language looks like a show that is far from over. Indeed, words are being imported and exported, even as I speak. So I think it's about time for me to hang up my hat and wet my whistle. What will it be? I'll have a bayou crocodile and make it snappy. Wet your whistle comes from the days when Norsemen used to attach whistles to the end of their drinking horns in order to attract the attention of the barman. Good grief. Thanks very much. Cheers. Before I go, I'd like to leave you with one thought. The English language has become a global language simply because it's come from all over the world. Bottoms up. I like it. Same again. Hey now, say now, let's get away now. Words at the end of the day I talk, you talk, they talk, we all talk